Hello and welcome to the 2023 Malaysia Maritime Week. And thank you for sitting in on our book review session. We're very happy to see these uh, each and every one of you here. But of course, if any of you are still wandering around looking at the exhibition, you're very welcome to join this book review session. Come stay a while and listen. So ladies and gentlemen, this mini event is organized by the Maritime Institute of Malaysia, or MIMA for short. We are a policy research institute for all methods maritime in Malaysia. And subject matters include economics, the environment, um, law and policies, safety and security, and our interests at sea. So on these subjects, we provide consultancy services. Uh, we advise government policies with research, and we conduct many awareness and dissemination activities, such as publications like this one. So I'm Huda Mahmoud from MIMA, and please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Mama Yazid Zulkepi. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Yazid. Once again, thank you for your support. Uh, if you're still wandering around, come stay a while and listen. We are here to discuss our latest publication with its author, Dr. Yazid. For your information, this book was jointly published with PNI Malaysia. They provide protection and indemnity insurance for ship owners, covering various legal liabilities at sea. So I want to let the author in himself discuss the book he wrote before opening the floor for questions from the audience. So please gather those questions and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this discussion. Dr. Yazid, thank you for agreeing to share your work with us today. Your book, Shipping and Logistics in Malaysia, was launched by the Minister of Transport, Honorable Lok Siew Book himself in April. So it's definitely a significant amount of work to put together this subject matter into 588 pages. So maybe could you please introduce yourself and just give us some background of your experience with the shipping and logistics industry. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to everyone. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Yazid Zulkifli. Uh, you can all call me Dr. Yazid. Uh, I'm from I, I'm the Deputy Dean from Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws International Islamic University Malaysia, uh, the largest producer of law graduates in Malaysia. Out of uh, 21,000 lawyers in Malaysia, out of 21,000 lawyers in Malaysia, around 4,000 came from our university. Uh, I completed my doctorate uh, from the University of Hong Kong in 2012 and my and the focus of my dissertation is on shipping, uh, shipping and logistics. Uh, since then, I've been serving International Islamic University of Malaysia. In addition to that, I've also been conducting training for the shipping industry and also for financial institutions, uh, focusing more on uh, finance and for the shipping side uh, on shipping and logistics. Thank you. So that was an extensive background, an extensive involvement in the shipping industry itself. But to write this very comprehensive book, what actually motivated you to write this whole textbook? Okay, thank you for the question. I take note that many of the books on shipping, especially shipping law and shipping logistics, most of the books are very expensive. If you go to uh, Kinoponia or if you go to other law books like Master and all, you will take note that many of the shipping book, especially shipping law textbook, uh, can cost around uh, 1,000 ringgit to 3,000 ringgit, which I believe is beyond the budget for students and also young practitioner. So one of my hope when I proceed with, the, with this book is to produce a book, a comprehensive book that cover all topics related to shipping and logistics with affordable price. Uh, from my understanding, the price of the uh, book is only 100 ringgit. The price of the book is only 100 ringgit, which, and it's also hardcover, yes. which I believe is very affordable for uh, for those in the industry, for those in the shipping industry and all. Because it's just 100 ringgit compared to 1,000 to 3,000 ringgit for outside books. So I believe it's affordable. Another reason is uh, my supervisor, my pro my supervisor, Professor uh, Felix Chan from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he also produced a book, uh, Shipping and Logistic, Shipping and Logistic Principles and Practice in Hong Kong. So back when I was a student there, I did know that the book was very good because it provides, uh, it, it, the coverage is complete. It covers all 
important topics in a single volume, in a single textbook. So that's my idea with the book, to produce a single book that can assist our students and young practitioners and those in the industry to understand better Malaysia shipping and logistic industry by referring to only a single book instead of having to go through all these articles, book and all that. So if you want to know about, about Malaysian government blueprint, blueprint the law, the regulation, everything you can find in a single volume. So that's the motivation. Thank you. That's pretty great. And I'm just going through the um, table of contents and I think you've definitely achieved that. Uh, you can go through the book if you can see it at our, uh, at our exhibition booth at the back there. But it goes through maritime trade, maritime history, logistics, the international legal framework, the national legal framework, Admiralty Court. So you've written about a very comprehensive framework of uh, the policies, laws, regulations, uh, authorities, enforcement involved in the maritime industry. So from your perspective, I just want to know down the line, what is the outlook for our maritime industry? What does it look like in five, ten years? Are there any emerging trends or opening up opportunities that will really shape the development of our industry? Okay, when we talk about the prospect or the outlook for Malaysian maritime industry, I believe that we need to look, we need to have a look at the global aspect as well, the global aspect and also the regional aspect. The truth is that also our, although our development in Malaysia is okay, okay is not enough because nowadays we are having more challenges than before. For example, if you look at Indonesia uh, and also Vietnam, uh, both of these countries, Indonesia and Vietnam, they are also, uh, they are also very rapidly uh, progressing. Uh, in the past, when we talk about uh, maritime industry, the, the leaders mostly include Malaysia and Singapore. Malaysia and Singapore, we are at the Front. But nowadays, when we talk about the outlook for Malaysia, we need to take note, we need to take into consideration the rise of other countries, uh, especially uh, Indonesia and Vietnam. So, we need to consider, for example, new technology, for example, ships or cruise, uh, ship with a cruise, autonomous shipping, and all that. We need to consider all this. Uh, for a good example, is Singapore. Singapore is, uh, is uh, preparing a lot for the future and they their policy is to make sure that their logistic and also their ports are future ready. Future ready means we are not only uh, looking at the current challenges, but we are thinking about the future. What is the latest development? What changes will occur? Uh, so we anticipate and we need to be ready for it. So to answer your question in simple word, the outlook is good. The outlook is good for Malaysia, but good is not enough. Good is not enough because if our neighbors, for example, are better, uh, in the end, uh, the industry will shift there. People will go to the, to the neighbors. So good is not enough. We need to be, we need to be the best. Uh, we need to aim to be the best. Thank you. Would you say that uh, competition in the region is one of the main challenges that we face in the industry? Uh, among others. What about our key strengths then? As a, maritime, as a national maritime industry, what is our biggest strength? Okay, what are the strengths of the Malaysian maritime industry? What are the main strengths? The answer is you are. Okay, you are all the main strength for the Malaysian maritime industry. In other words, the human factor. We can have the technology, we can have the financing and all that. But the most important thing, in order to go forward, the main strength is, is always the, the human factor. The government, the private sector, the coordination with universities and academicians and all that. So the main strength for the Malaysian maritime industry is actually the, the human factor. That being said, we need to, to improve on that. In addition to that, there's a lot of other aspects. For example, when you look at Malaysia, for example, if you look at the map, if you look at the map of Malaysia, you will take note that actually the land size is not that big. Okay, if you look at the land, the, the, the size of the land is not that, that big. The biggest one is actually the, the sea area. We have a very large sea area. If you look at sub-China Sea and all that. Unfortunately, although this is in a way our strength, for example, for our EZ, for our exclusive economic zones, we are claiming up to 200 nautical miles, we are, which, which is actually a lot. We are claiming up to 200 nautical miles. But in reality, if we think about it, what about our fishermen? Are our fishermen going to the high sea to go for all these fish or are we still relying on outside, on, on foreign uh, fish and all that? So this is something to think about. It is in a way our strength, but it can also be our weaknesses. Um, so to summarize it, there are a few 
main strength the first one is always the the human factor in addition to that we have the large eez the large sea area we have active maritime sector strategic location considerable marine infrastructure maritime logistic and if you are talking about logistic we also have world class ports so when we talk about logistic it's okay it's not bad our logistics are world class to a certain extent and then we have large and capable shipyards uh, one of the largest operators of gas tankers we have a uh, beautiful coastline and islands so when we talk about strength uh, the uh, they are many strength but as i mentioned before the main strength for the Ma malaysian maritime sector is you all the human factor thank you I want to go further into the outlook uh, for businesses because nowadays we always hear that we're moving towards sustainability as a growth strategy. So all businesses are trying to uh, incorporate ESG principles. We have to work towards sustainable development, SDG goals, right? So for it, for an industry that is so capital intensive, machinery investments all require uh, a surmountable amount of um, investment. What do you think sustainability can do to contribute to its growth? Okay, first when we talk about the idea of sustainability, I think we should have the right mindset. Uh, we are talking about this, uh, this planet. The truth is that we are not, we do not own this planet. We do not own this planet. We share this planet with the future generation. That is the main idea behind sustainability. We want to provide a better world for our children, for our children, for our grandchildren and all that. That's the general idea behind sustainability. Not, it's not just about us, you know, it's also about future generation. So nowadays, uh, at United Nations level, at international level, and, and also at national level, there's a lot of talk about sustainability. We need to make sure that shipping is sustainability, the maritime industry is sustainable and all that. But the truth is that this is easier said than done. This is easier said than done. If we really want to proceed with sustainability, especially if we want to get more participation, active participation from the industry, the truth is that the government also need to offer better incentive. Because when we talk about all these uh, sustainability matters, in many situations, it can be costly. It can be costly, it's a game changer and all that. So without proper financial incentive, for example, the shipping industry, uh, the partners from the private sector, they will not participate. Because in the end, when we are talking about business, business is basically money making in, in the end. In order to attract them, to support all the sustainability issues and all that, we need to offer practical incentive. And in order to do that, we can also compare to the best practices of other countries in the world. Okay, we look at Japan, we look at uh, European Union, what are the incentives that they are offering. We need to compile all the list and start offering this to the, to the shipping industry. Otherwise, it will just be theoretical in nature. Thank you. Let's zoom in on the ports, one of the biggest spenders that you know um, are autonomous by, its, uh, by itself in terms of investments. So you mentioned in your book, uh, emerging technologies like autonomous shipping and smart ports, autonomous vessels at sea, for example. What do you think of this way forward? Do you believe that our industry is prepared uh, to go through with this kind of emerging technologies? Okay, uh, thank you for that very interesting question. In order to do this, uh, it would be great if we look at previous technology. We can look at previous technology. For example, is there anyone here who still use the old Nokia, for example, 3310? <laughs> I believe not, right? Most of us, I, I believe all of us, or at least 90% of us, right now we are using smartphone. Maybe we are using Apple or Oppo or Samsung, but the essence is that we are using smartphone we are no longer using the old technology so when we talk about talk about technology it's like that it's not something gradual we might think oh when we talk about shipping about autonomous ship ship without master and crew ship uh, without much crew and all that autonomous ship smart port maybe we think are like these are the things of the future but that is not how technology work technology often take us by surprise okay what taken by surprise for example chat gpt I did not thought that this technology will be that available to the public during my lifetime. It's like basically you are conversing with a very smart person, depending on your, the nature of your question. But basically when we talk about 
technology is not gradual in nature. It can take us by surprise. The same thing happened to phone. And if we are not prepared, uh, our competitors, and we have a lot of competitors nowadays, our competitors will leave us behind. For example, autonomous ship, a simple example. Let's say this autonomous ship can save a lot of money. It can save a lot of money because we don't have to uh, deal with uh, captain, crew, the logistic for human and all that. Because in the future, once they they complete this autonomous ship, even right now we have like more, more than 1,000 autonomous ships in various types. Okay, not all of them are crewless. Some have crew but still fall under the definition of autonomous ship. Okay, in the future, when we have the rise of this autonomous ship and all that, this kind of ship will not be able to come to our port. Okay, the ships will not be able to come to our port if we do not have the logistic and technology. Instead, they will go to, to other advanced port. Most probably, they will go to Singapore and all that. And this will be a, a big waste. And when we talk about shipping, shipping is a very efficient market. The meaning is that, uh, for example, you buy, uh, you go to the mall and then you buy banana. Okay, you buy banana. banana. The price is not too expensive. The price is not as too ex the price is quite cheap if you want to buy banana in Malaysia. Although the banana is from other country, it's from other country. The reason is because the shipping cost is very cheap. The shipping cost is very cheap. Although banana is very uh, is very sensitive to temperature, you must control the temperature if you want the banana to be to be good. But yet we still manage to import all this banana from other country at quite a cheap logistic cost. The shipping cost is not expensive. Why? Because shipping is very efficient. What is the meaning of shipping is very efficient? The meaning is that it's very competitive. If we are slightly higher than our competitors, the client will go to the competitors. Uh, so when we talk about this new technology, if we are not preparing uh, in advance for this uh, technology, we will lose to the competitors. So it's not an option. Uh, we must participate now for the uh, advanced technology, including smart port, including uh, autonomous vessels and all that. The secret is also involving cooperation and alliance. For example, for Singapore, for example, they're having a lot of cooperation with uh, Netherlands and all, all the developed country because they understand that we need to be in the know. We, we need to be involved and we cannot just uh, follow up later. By that time, we already, we already lost the market. Thank you. So you spoke a lot about disruption in terms of technology and how it will come suddenly and we'll have to be prepared for it. But we have something else to worry about at that juncture as well because we were looking at our workforce. You mentioned earlier that it's one of our key strengths. But there have been reports of shortage of seafarers in the next decade, for example. We're going to have a shortage of skilled officers. We're going to need people who know how to man these unmanned vessels, for example, or smart ports. Um, but if we're having uh, problems or issues retaining this kind of talent, then I think we'll see a bigger challenge up ahead in trying to anticipate this kind of disruptions. So what do you think we can do to prevent this kind of outflow of talent and how can we retain them within the country? Uh, brain drain is a very serious problem. The essence of the idea is like this. Many of the experts, especially experts in the shipping industry, they understand that other country, foreign country like Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, European Union, in general, these countries, they can offer a much better payment. They can offer a much better payment. So what happened is many of the experts, they decided to, to live there. But it's more than, it's not just about payment. It's not just about payment, it's also about strategy about strategy about having a plan to retain all these experts in, in the in the first place. I give, I give a simple example. Let's say someone he spent his time in Tokyo or in Hong Kong or in New Zealand for a postgraduate study and that person become an expert. That person become an expert in logistics and shipping. Okay after spending many years studying and all that that person become expert. And then we have a jurisdiction offering five times compared to what Malaysia offer. For example, let's say Malaysia offer for the for academic aspect, for example, for academician they offer around up to ten thousand, up to ten thousand ringgit. But other country they are offering up to five times more, like fifty thousand ringgit or sixty thousand ringgit. So most people when they have an offer ten thousand ringgit, and the other one is fifty or sixty thousand ringgit, they will decide to go to the to the higher one, fifty or sixty thousand ringgit. But the truth is, though, is that it's not just about the payment. Sometimes we cannot compete in the term of payment because in the end they can always offer more. But we need to have strategy how to 
how to convince these experts or those with the expertise in the shipping industry and even seafarers, for example, to stay Malaysia instead of living Malaysia. The essence, I believe, is that we need to show them that we appreciate their we appreciate their expertise and all that. It's not just about money. Okay, just to be clear, it's not just about money. Uh, but, but we need to have strategy and, and plan. Uh, this include, for example, scholarship. If you look at China, nowadays China is a very big superpower and China actually spend a lot in terms of scholarship, for example, scholarship for seafarers, scholarship for students. So by giving all this funding for education and all that, so they have a lot of experts. So nowadays, for example, uh, from the perspective of China, for example, they are sending a lot of experts to study uh, international law in relation to boundary, uh, maritime boundary, so that they can claim South China Sea. But we see the long-term long term plan. Uh, plan. In Malaysia, if we are not thinking about the long-term plan, we will lose a lot. We will lose a lot. We will keep on having this problem of uh, brain drain. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yazid, uh, for going into these topics with us. Of course, not everything we just discussed is going to be available in the book verbatim. So we really appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts with us further. So I want to open the floor for questions from the audience now. So once again, I appreciate this crowd for your attention. We'd love to hear from you and your questions, so please raise your hand and when the mic is afforded to you, please give us your name and affiliation and then your question, please. Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry I came a little late, but uh, let me just introduce myself and my students. We are from Maritime Universities, and my students are those with a uh, yellow t-shirt and their jacket. Okay, um, my question is, we have been talking a lot about uh, oh, I, uh, uh, the speaker just now, um, Prof. Uh, Yazid. You did mention something about uh, unmanned vehicle. Uh, I believe you did also mention about uh, optimization and so on. However, <clears throat> I would like to share with you my discussion with uh, some officials from uh, some port in which I, would like, I, would, I wouldn't want to say something. I wouldn't want to introduce the new of the port, but uh, this is his uh, option or rather his opinion insofar as uh, port I, I concerned. Uh, according to him, uh, I, I believe uh, his statement is just to presenting the strategy of his sport, right? So, this is what he said. We still have excess capacity, right? We still have excess capacity. Maybe uh, another a million to use to go before we reach the ultimate uh, full capacity. So, why should we invest in POC IR now when we still have existing capacity within the existing system? So, why should we invest? invest in uh, post IR for example. And then number two, um, he said we shouldn't be talking about post IR now, we should be talking about what is the framework for us to reach the level of post IR. What is the low hanging fruits that we should be talking about? What is the framework in terms of uh, skill, in terms of uh, technology, know-how, in terms of uh, whatever technology that we need to invest uh, what do you call this? Uh, this uh, learning to should consider the fact that we have existing uh, uh, existing uh, technology that we have spent millions of dollars. Should we just dismantle all this technology and come up with new brain for example with all the IR uh, IR core? Or is there a, how shall I say a roadmap? Uh, so that we can gradually go into uh, that would be my question. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that very interesting question. Okay. First of all, uh, I think we can look at the matter from a few perspectives. A simple example. In 2008, in 2008, I went to Hong Kong. I went to the University of Hong Kong to proceed with uh, my dissertation, with my PhD dissertation. 
Hong Kong is well known as a financial center for the world. Okay, in addition, besides Singapore, uh, Hong Kong is also one of the financial center for the world. At that time, in 2008, the government of Hong Kong was introducing a new legislation in order to cater to Islamic finance, uh, Islamic banking system. So I also talked with my supervisor about that. Hong Kong is already a center for the banking industry, for the financial industry. It's already one of the most developed in the world. So why is it that Hong Kong want to venture for Islamic finance, which is not really their specialty and to a certain extent, we can say it is a bit unnecessary. It is unnecessary for Hong Kong, for a conventional financial center to be including Islamic finance as well. But then when I talked to my supervisor, my supervisor explained that in order to remain competitive, we must be comprehensive in our portfolio. It's not about uh, we, we are replacing everything and we want to invest a lot uh, in something new. Same with uh, for autonomous shipping, for all this. IR and all that. The thing is that we need to be in the know. We need to be in the know about the latest development and we need to make sure that we offer all these products in our portfolio. Okay, now we come back to shipping. When we talk about shipping, I'm not saying that we need to spend billions, for example, to focus on new, to new terminals to cater to uh, autonomous ships and all that. That is not the idea because we need to be very efficient when it comes to uh, spending money okay, because in the end of the day we do not want to waste money but at the same time we cannot be left outside a good example is Singapore a good example is Singapore what happened in Singapore they are not just wasting money or just spending billions for all this new technology but instead first of all they have a proper alliances with uh, foreign countries especially European Union uh, with Netherlands and all that so whenever there's any new development when it comes to uh, shipping technology, especially autonomous ship, they are on the know. Okay, what is the status of the new technology? What is the practical application? To what extent it, it will impact our ports? Uh, so in other words, we need to be part of the alliance. We need to know what is the latest technology and, and all that. Okay, and then when we talk about framework, skill and all that, the truth is that we are not having a, we have not developed a proper framework when it comes to Maritime industry and shipping. My example is my example, my meaning. The meaning is like this: When we talk about our direction for the future for the shipping industry, what kind of maritime nation do we want to be? Uh, do we want to produce more seafarers? Uh, we, do we want to produce more experts in engineering? Do we want to have uh, more ports? Or basically, what what is the meaning of that? So we need to have a clear target. We need to have a clear target, a, ne a clear idea. Are we going to train more seafarers? Or are we going to have more maritime lawyers? If we look at other countries, developed countries, most of the time they have a holistic system. But but of course they first start by identifying their targets. What is it that they want? In Malaysia, sad to say, the way I see it right now, our framework is still not comprehensive. We do not have a clear direction, and worse, we do not have a proper synergy between the industry, the government, and also the uh, academic sector, for example. We need to have synergy. For example, when we talk about syllabus, for example, syllabus for universities, for college, and all that, how sure are we that our, the syllabus is what the industry wanted? In other words, what is the practical application of it? Because we do not want a syllabus that is detached from the reality. And then when the uh, industry receive all the seafarers or all these graduates, the industry say, oh, all these are theoreticals in nature and are not so much associated with the practical work. We do not want that. But in order to avoid this, we need to have a synergy, which right now we do not have. We need to have a better synergy between the private sector, between the government, between the university, between the college. Thank you, sir. Um, for my presentation, you didn't catch me. Uh, Khaled. 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 Okay. Thank you so much. We can have one more question. Or two, or three. From the crowd? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Alec Nathan, So, my name is Mohd Ashraf. I'm a year, second year student in Bachelor of uh, Maritime Business from Maritime University. So, uh, just now I heard that you talked a lot about uh, autonomous ships, uh, autonomous ports, 
So how about uh, the documentation part uh, in, in in the parts or in the shapes? Uh, since uh, we as a maritime uh, business student, we will we, we'll be handling a lot uh, on the documentation. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you Mr. Ashraf, right? Thank you Mr. Ashraf for the question. Okay, the question is uh, mostly related to documentation in the shipping industry. Yes, we need to take note that nowadays we have a lot of new technology affecting the shipping industry. For example, even when we talk about standard document like bill of lading, okay, this is one of the main document in the maritime industry, bill of lading. We are also having a lot of new alternatives nowadays, including electronic bill of lading and all that. And then when we talk about documentation for certain items, there's also the introduction of the blockchain technology. So when we talk about blockchain, some people think about Bitcoin, about all these digital assets and all that. But actually, the, pr the practical application for blockchain is much more than for digital assets and speculation. You can also see this. Uh, this emergence of blockchain technology in relation to uh, logistic uh, items, uh, documentation, and and all that. So I believe that in the future, for any uh, academic institution to remain relevant, they must expose their students to the latest development in technology as well, and to explain how this latest development will reshape the maritime industry. So this is quite important. But I believe the answer should not be just in the form of textbook. There are certain limitations to what textbook can do. Sometimes it's better to have like a proper internship, internship or attachment with the shipping and logistic uh, companies so that the students will have a better idea about the software that they use, about the issues, the legal issues, the practical issues and all that. So for this kind of issues, if you ask me, the answer is not just in uh, textbook, but there should also be more engagement uh, with the industry, as I mentioned before, especially in the form of attachment and inter internship. Okay, thank you. Do I hear another question? I see lots of students, but I also hope there are industry people in the crowd as well. Um, while waiting for another question, perhaps we need to formulate it. Why don't I ask another question I had uh, for this book? How would you assess the level of government support in the current framework that we have in Malaysia? So, you, you of course, put together the whole framework here, but uh, you mentioned that we needed synergy. How do you assess the level of government support here? Okay, concerning the level of support of government, I take note that all Malaysian governments, the current government and also the previous governments uh, have always been very supportive of the maritime industry in Malaysia or the shipping industry in Malaysia. This is something very good regardless of the government because of course after election, sometimes we change government, we have new government. But regardless of governments, I take note that all governments pay attention to the maritime industry. They do give incentive, they do give support. The problem is that, I take note that although there is a steady support from governments all these years, we are not as proactive as we should be. We are not as proactive as we should be. So in many situations, we, we, we have like this, uh, if it's not broke, this kind of mentality, if it's not broken, better not to interfere with it. Okay? Uh, which, is, which can be the wrong approach. Because nowadays, we have so many competitors, rapid advancement of technology and all that. We, have, we need to have a more progressive way of thinking. Because uh, just because uh, liner, for example, is our customer, doesn't mean that that liner, that shipping liner will, will remain as a customer. We have seen alliances change in the shipping industry from time to time. As long as there's a better package from the country, from a country, sometimes uh, even... Uh, Long time friend can also switch alliance. So, therefore, in order to go forward, uh, we need to focus on all these things as well. But in the end, I believe the level of support is strong. That being said, for certain matter, for example, for environmental issues, sustainability issues, and all that, I believe we need to give better incentive to the industry. We want to push them to embrace this concept. Because in the end of the day, if we talk about all these sustainability things and all that, but we are not giving proper incentive to the private sector, to the industry, 
uh, they will just keep it to the minimum requirement. Okay, whatever law legally require is the minimum standard, they will comply. They will not really put effort into it. You want them to put more effort, we need to make sure that the incentive is also proportionate to the, to the request. Thank you. Do I have another question? Yes, please. Good evening, sir. Um, I'm Ethan. Uh, from, Nathan. Uh, yes, um, third year for uh, Bachelor of Science and Fund Business and from Meritus University as well. Um, I would like to ask uh, about the convention. So, since um, maritime industry, there's various convention uh, involved, right? So, how how do you see this convention ready to have uh, its um, our the, the, the existing convention uh, can capture the um, the coming um, type of IR and the advancement that I mentioned earlier on? Thank you. Uh, uh, Nathan, right? Okay. Thank you, Nathan, for that very interesting. Ethan. 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 Oh, Ethan. Like Ethan Hawk. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ethan, for the question. The question is related to convention. Convention also, we can call them uh, international treaty. International treaty or conventions that regulate uh, shipping matters. Okay, we take note, before the emergence of the first convention, basically on the Hague Rules, for example, uh, before that, the shipping industry was basically left to themselves. So there's a lot of uh, ship owners taking advantage over, over the people. They put all these clauses, they say that no matter what happened to your no matter what happened to your carriage, no matter what happened to your goods, basically the ship owners will not take any responsibility. So basically what happened was in the beginning there's a lot of limitation clauses, a lot of exclusion clauses, which basically uh, Ship owners use these limitation clauses to escape any liability. So because of this problem, the work community, especially the government, decided we need to protect the interests of those in the shipping industry, especially the shippers as well. So they decided to proceed with uh, international convention. So they created the first international convention, the Hague, the Hague Rules. The Hague Rules was the first uh, international convention on this matter uh, in 1920s and then it was embraced by the majority of the country in the world because this international convention provides for the minimum standard for the for the shipping industry. Before this, we do not have a proper minimum standard. But with the head rules, we have a minimum standard. Uh, not, for example, the ship must be seaworthy. If the ship is not seaworthy, you cannot put limitation clause that say that even if the ship is not seaworthy, the ship order will not be liable. You cannot do that because now we have a minimum standard. So that was the Hague rules. After some time, people proceed with the Hague Bisbee rules, a variation of the original law, uh, the a variation of the original international convention, but it's more or less the same as the Hague rules. The Hague Bisbee rules do not consist of a major changes to the Hague rules. The idea is they provide for minimum standard. Around 50 years later, uh, from the uh, from, from, from the uh, original convention, the world community decided to go for the Hamburg Rule, okay, another convention. Okay, the problem with this Hamburg, Hamburg Rule is that it's more complicated. People say that for the Hague Rules and the Hague PCB Rule, the conventions, the law was basically made by the industry. So the industry keep it very short, very short, easy to understand, easy for everyone to Understand, but when when they go to the Hamburg rules, the Hamburg rules become very complicated. So not many countries decided to use the latest uh, this Hamburg Hamburg rule, and then people make it more complicated. In the latest one, we have the Rotterdam rule. This Rotterdam rule is unnecessarily difficult. If you read the Rotterdam rule, anyone um, who read the the law, you will take note that this Rotterdam rule is unnecessarily complicated hard to understand and the wordings are also not nicely nicely done. So in the end, countries do not embrace Rotterdam rule. Okay, long story short, what I want to highlight is that the real answer for the shipping industry is not about the convention. It's not about whether you're using the Hague rules or the Hague Bisbee rules or the Hamburg rules or the Rotterdam rules. That is not the solution for the maritime industry. For parties in the sectors, the real solution is more on the contractual terms. But because when we talk about the rights of parties, there are a few sources of rights of parties. 
For example, one is of course the law, like uh, Hague rules or Hague business rules, that has been transformed into national law. But more than that, when we talk about business, it's mostly about contract. So the most important thing is the contractual terms, okay, the terms in the bill of lading, the terms in the documentation. It must be very, uh, it must be very, uh, it must be precisely done. Okay, so the lawyers or the counsel or anyone working with the shipping or logistic companies or other parties in the maritime industry, they must pay a lot of attention to the terms of the contract because the term of the contract will determine everything. Okay, uh, although there are certain limitations by law, but in general, there's a lot of flexibility. So we should focus more on contractual terms to remedy whatever minor deficiencies that we can find in the international convention. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Sudah Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Mama Aizakul Aikal Bizanuri and I'm from Meritus University. Uh, I want to ask, uh, we know that uh, Malaysia has been uh, want to develop a career island. So, uh, in your opinion, what the impact of uh, Kerry Island in Malaysian logistics and is it the significant uh, can be on par with uh, Singapore when they are when they looking uh, to us? Yes, okay, thank you for the question. Very interesting one. The answer is not that clear. Uh, first, let me share my view, my overview on, on, on this matter. Okay, when we talk about port development, when we talk about port development and logistic, in many situations, people think about expansion. They think about expansion, they, are, they think about getting more investment from national and also from international funders, maybe from other countries, maybe from some certain international banks and all that. So the idea they think is about expansion. But because the idea is that, when we have this bigger, better port and all that, we'll have more customer, more profit and all. But in reality, it's not necessarily so. It's not necessarily so. A simple example is uh, we can look at uh, Sri Lanka port, for example. Sri Lanka port, uh, concerning Sri Lanka port, the government was too ambitious. The government was too ambitious and then there was too much funding. There was uh, too much borrowing, too much loan from uh, China government, from, from that one. And when they were, when the country was unable to make back the repayment, unable to make repayment, in the end, they, to a certain extent, they lost their control over their national port, the Sri Lanka port. So China took over for like 99 years because of the inability of the port and the inability of the government to repay back the, the loan. So when we talk about expansion, we should not just be too excited when we look at the number. Oh, there are billions of investments we are getting from here and from that. More than that, we need to look at the nature of the financing. Is it partnership? Is it a partnership where if I fall, you will fall as well? If that is the nature of the partnership, then it's okay. Most probably, the one who lend the money will think twice before they lend the money because uh, we will be in this together. But if at the core of the financing, it's merely a loan, okay, it's basically the nature of the relationship, it's debtor and creditor, we will need to be more careful because sometimes, uh, we might not be able to make repayment because of things outside our control. Nowadays, there's a lot of things outside our control. A simple example is Russia. When we look at, about the recent Russia and Ukraine war, which in reality is not Russia-Ukraine war. In reality, it's actually conflict between Europe, between European Union, between Europe and Russia. So, but we can see the, the effect, the effect of, the, of this big fight to the world economy. Right, to the price of food, to the price of grain, to shipping, to logistics, we can see the, the consequence. So, okay, let us look at the context of Malaysia. Right now, many uh, experts in military and all that, they see escalation uh, in the tension between China, for example, and United States, especially in relation to matter involving Taiwan and all. If the matter keep on escalating, what will happen if, for example, it escalate to an extent that it affect the shipping industry? We take note that many of our shipping, our shipping industry basically rely a lot on shipment from China to Europe. But if these things keep on escalating, uh, we cannot be too sure about the uh, positive effect to the shipping industry because uh, maybe it will affect the pricing, maybe there will be sanction, maybe there will be no new law and all that. 
So despite our optimism when it comes to the scary island, massive development and all, we need to always think about the worst scenario event as well. I, I'm, I'm not being pessimistic, I'm just saying I'm optimistic, but at the same time we must also be prepared for the worst. We do not want to be to get involved with unnecessary debt, which can be very big in nature, and in the end we cannot repay, and then we will burden the future generation. We do not want that. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Do I hear any question? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been honored to share space with you today to discuss our DMC's book. So if there's one thing we can take away from look at least on my part, is that the foundations of an industry, and oftentimes that is the laws, policies, and its regulations, they're the important building blocks for growth. So we have to strengthen, we have to plan and develop and then anticipate from these principles. And then hopefully we'll see even more developments in the maritime industry. But, but yeah, so what is your takeaway? Okay, my takeaway from all this is uh, the only way forward is together. That's the only way we can go forward together. We need a better participation between the future generation, to the students and all that and also the private sector, and also the government sector, and government agency. That's the only way we can go together. If the government tries to dictate, but without the participation of the private sector, that will not do. If the private sector wants to go forward, but there's not enough incentive from the government, that will not do as well. So I think the only way forward is together. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the audience for spending your precious time with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, Shipping and Logistics in Shipping and Logistics in Malaysia is jointly published by MIMA and PNI Malaysia and is widely available through MIMA's website and social media. You can also pick up a copy at the exhibition book at the back there today or even take some information for later purchase. So connect and reach out to us, please, as well as Dr. Yazid. We would love reviews, discussions about them further, and thank you so much for participating in this book review discussion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.